that everybody back there back then were outdoorsy to a degree you know they cooked with wood and you know they didn't have all the creature comforts we did nowadays so if someone back then describes someone as out you know just the epitome of the outdoors type he was, must have been a hard working bust your ass you know and go, he was yeah he hunted he worked hard and enjoyed drinking too now he came from a family of very hospitable personal people he was popular. He had a lot of friends in the community. People really liked Charlie. And he was described as helpful, always lending a hand to raise a barn or build a fence. And then after the work was done, he was fun to be around, making jokes, you know, kind of carrying on. So people really enjoyed Charlie's company. I kind of imagine him today as the guy who would just be the life of the party. Yeah. And back then, that was uh, really fun to be around because uh, entertainment is very limited. Right. Like you're around this funny guy, you might tell some jokes or, you know, just have people laughing. That's like if someone could sing back then. That was a big deal. Yeah, he was definitely like an entertainer, just the life of the party. You know, you work hard with him all day and then he's going to stick around. You might take a couple of nips of moonshine. Yeah, I have he's a couple of nips. tell you some stories, maybe tell you a dirty joke or two. A couple of nips whatever. off the jug, have some yeah. laughs. Kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, how you are when we go to the fish fry. Well, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I like to I like to bullshit with my boys. Yeah, I know you do. Yeah. Well, Frankie was also described as a hard worker. Though young, she tended house, helped inside and outside the home. As I mentioned, the pair had built the small cabin, which was like typical homestead for the time. Um, and as I mentioned, it was by the Silvers home. So just over from Charlie's parents. So right there, kind of in the backyard of the in-laws. She was also described as a good housekeeper. On the loom, she could spend three yards of cotton a day, as they say, on the big wheel. Uh, yes, actually, when I was reading that, that seemed to be like a big deal that a woman, you know, anyone could spend that much because they're literally taking the yarn and making cloth, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, or, uh, yeah. And so a lot of people described her as just like, this amazing, like, hard worker, and she was really talented, spinning on this big wheel, and could just crank out the, you know, the yards of cotton. Kind of known for that. She was also described as a tiny force. So even though she was slight in stature, she worked hard, and she kind of had a bit of an assertive disposition, for which was a little unusual for, you know, a woman at that time. Well, yeah, right. Cause I mean, they women were, more... were a little bit more demure back then. Maybe um, not as vocal. The men were definitely the head of the household. It was a man's world. But they said Frankie was a, a bit of a firecracker. So she was a, kind of a standout in women back then, right? Well, yeah, I guess she didn't mind to, to speak her mind here and there. Yeah. December 22nd, 1831. That's a long time ago. Yeah. Charlie was planning to go hunting the next day, which would have been the 23rd. And there wasn't a great deal of firewood at the cabin, so Frankie had asked him to split some wood before he headed out on his hunting trip. Now, Charlie would often go hunting for days at a time, leaving Frankie and their baby daughter, Nancy, home alone. And at this time, Nancy was about 13 months old. Still, you know, quite small. A year after the marriage, they had had the child. So not very long after they got married, had this little girl. Christmas was coming up, and Charlie was going to fetch the family some meat for the holiday. Charlie went out. He took down a hickory tree. He spent most of the day, you know, hewing off the limbs, splitting the trunk until there were logs that would fit into the fireplace. you got to imagine, that is hard work. I mean, oh. they didn't have chainsaws. It was all done by hand with an axe. Well, I'll tell you, I've done, you know, um, I've spent many a day uh, sawing up a tree and getting it and, and then busting it. Even, uh, I, I never used a log splitter. I, I would use a pole axe and a wedge. But even that is, you know, talking about worn out, but felling a tree with an axe, delimbing it with the same axe, then chopping it into, you're going to imagine like a, a 18 inches or less pieces and splitting it. My God. That... So that's why in the beginning of the story, I kind of mentioned that some people have stereotypes of like the lazy hillbilly. Well, that's a man right there. That's, or, or a woman. The one, women did plenty of work every day just to get dinner on the table and the kids safe and the cows milked and the animals fed. And the, I mean, that's just those people back then, period, were just hardcore. 
Right. Um, uh, yeah. And Definitely. that's probably why they could eat bacon and biscuits and real butter and grease and all that all the time. And, and drink the milk straight from the cow. And drink the milk straight it's from the cow. And not, they needed that because they're burning <laughs> 4,000 calories a day. Yeah. Well, you can imagine how physically stout Charlie was. Yeah. And don't be fooled because women of this day were strong, too. I mean, back then, men and women alike knew how to swing an axe and shoot a gun. It was just necessity. Oh, you want to talk about washing clothes? They're actually scrubbing it on a washboard and wringing by hand. And just everything they did back then was hard. Well, you know... My family, the women in my family, uh, could people would describe us as physically stout. I've had someone tell me before, girl, you got some sturdy legs. And well, I was like, well, I'm not sure if that's a compliment. But my nana, she yeah. was a pretty strong woman. My granny in pictures, I'm like, you know, she had some guns. Oh, no, you guys are uh, you guys are off of a line of homesteaders. Oh, we are. And yeah. so uh, you can really make a homestead evol- with these women. Evolution has uh, kind of made, you know, I, I fit into that. Well, no, I can totally probably go plow a field, right? Well, no, given <laughs> that you have some direct ties to some old blood, which would I would think would be old blood you know connected years you know to when they first you know people first came pushing up on shore here before they fucked everybody up and killed everybody but anyway um yeah i'm more of a mishmash of whatever but yeah you you, the hyatts here in haywood county uh, can directly be linked straight back to literally when they're you know the boats are pulling up to shore so when i think about these people swinging axes shooting guns this necessity i mean i'm thinking about like my people because it I mean, is. If you listen to the episode where I talked to my mom, she describes a lot of this hard work that she was doing as a kid, and that was just a few decades ago. Right. So I'm thinking about little Frankie. I mean, she's probably a sturdy, sturdy little stout woman. Well, you say 90 pounds, but with her strength and all the stuff she has to do back then, she could probably whoop, straight up whoop some people's ass nowadays because we're is, soft. And this is important. So keep these details in mind. I'm not getting off on a tangent here. But I'm just thinking about um, Frankie and, and the case that's going to unfold here and why it's important to keep in mind that she may have been a petite little woman, but she was mighty. <laughs> she was probably wiry as fuck. <laughs> right. As strong as I'll get out. Charlie racked up the wood enough for a week and came into the house where Frankie was cooking supper. The two had dinner. Now, Charlie was known to nap by the fireplace. One of the things he was known to do was lie on the floor which you got to consider was plank, wood floor, in front of the heat. But he would prop his head, like his neck up, on this little wooden stool. Yeah, that makes my neck stiff, like, just thinking about it. Yeah. I get a crick. Ouch. Yeah, but it sounds like he was a, a fairly sizable man, maybe long and lanky. So that's what he liked to do. And Frankie would later say Charlie snuggled up with their baby daughter for a bit, then dozed off into, you know, a little bit of a nap. He'd worked hard all day, got a belly, got that puppy belly full of food, probably some biscuits or cornbread or something like that. Oh, I guarantee it. Slips off into a nice little coma. So she picked the baby up and put the baby in the cradle, you know, to sleep. The next morning, December 23rd, Mrs. John. Now, some people say that Charlie's father was John Silver and other people say his name was Jacob Silver. So that's another thing that there's a little bit of misinformation kind of floating around. But I believe John was his actual name. Well, Mrs. John Silver, which is Charlie's mother, and her two daughters were outside washing clothes, as you mentioned, those washboards. That's an all-day job. Yeah. So they're out there washing clothes, hanging laundry when they saw Frankie approaching. Frankie said, you're at it early. I've been at it myself since before daylight. So she's been up working hard, too. When one of Charlie's sisters asked about her brother, Frankie said he'd gotten up early to go hunting. He had headed over the river to hunt, making his way to George Young's house. And Young was a friend of Charlie's, and he would hunt there occasionally. It was reported that Frankie then went to her parents' cabin. She returned home later. By late afternoon, she was back at the Silver's cabin. She told them she was going to stay over at her parents' house because Charlie wasn't back from hunting, and she didn't want to stay home alone. Frankie said Charlie had fed the cow that morning, but asked if Charlie's brother Alfred might go feed the cow again. Mrs. Silver's would later say Frankie seemed nervous and suspicious when she was talking about Charlie's absence. Oh, no. 
17-year-old Alfred went to the cabin to feed the cow. He noted there were no footprints near the cow shed, only those of a woman. So not Charlie's footprints. It had snowed there so he could kind of see some of the tracks in the snow. So, Which at the time, I guess, he didn't think anything about that, really. But then later, he's well, like, wait a minute. Her having said he would fed him this morning. Yeah. I didn't see any. I didn't even see Charlie's footprints. Okay. So that is going to come into play here in a few minutes. Christmas Eve and Christmas Day came and went. No sign of Charlie. Frankie had returned back to their cabin. And on Christmas Day, she took Nancy to the Silver's cabin, which would be, you know, Nancy's grandparents. Uh, Frankie seemed like she was in a foul mood about Charlie's disappearing act. She said she was so angry that he had stayed gone through the holidays that she didn't even care if he came back at all. She then went to the Stewart home place again to stay another night. So she goes to her in-laws. It's Christmas. She's visiting with them. Charlie's not back. And he was known to go hunt for days at a time. And it was rumored that sometimes he would be, you know, hunting but he might be laid up somewhere drunk. Oh, so yeah. So he'd go put work in, but stick a day in the middle of it to kind of just not be at home and do whatever Charlie wants. Yeah. Okay. So she'd gone back to her parents' house to spend another night. Well, by December 26, the Silvers were concerned about Charlie. Uh, he would go hunting, and as I mentioned, sometimes for days at a time. But with the holiday, they felt, you know, he would have come home. Right. To stay gone through Christmas, that just wasn't like Charlie. A group of mountain men were gathered to do a search for him. They combed the areas around the Tow River, slopes of, you know, Mount Mitchell. Now, these were skilled navigators. They were out in this land all the time. They were hunting. I mean, they really knew the land. Trackers? Yeah. Yeah. So, it's not like they're just doing a... Eh, he's not out here, a little search. It's I mean, not like they don't know how to search the woods and surrounding thorough, area. And they're trackers, so they can tell if someone's been here. You know, maybe someone's been here hunting. I mean, they could kind of tell these things. But there were no signs of Charlie anywhere. Not a hide in your hair, as they say. John Silver and the Silver family was really worried. John, I guess, even went as far as contacting the sheriff to say, hey, we can't find Charlie, he's missing. John had heard of a man in Tennessee, roughly maybe 40 miles away, a conjure man. He was a slave owned by someone named Williams. Do you know what a conjure man is? I know, but I'm going to guess he's just some kind of like um, witch doctorish kind of voodoo. Yeah, conjure men, also known as juju men, oh, okay. witch doctors, root doctors, etc., and now they use like voodoo, Santeria, Macumba to kind of help, I guess, in their conjuring. Yeah, so they're going to be reading tea leaves or throwing bones or, you know, just something and claiming to see something in it, right? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, we live fairly close to the um, Cherokee Reservation. Yeah. And I know people around here who've said, oh, no, you've been conjured. Yeah, or somebody's working roots on you. Yeah. So you've heard that too. Yeah. Right. Well, this guy again was a slave owned by this fellow named Williams. So Silver loaded up his horse and made the two-day trip over to Tennessee to try to seek out this man who had this slave with this particular skill set. See, isn't that funny? We think 40 miles nowadays. I could be there in 25 minutes in good traffic, right? Yeah. But um, back then, that was a... Big deal, 40, 50 miles. Yeah, two days. I mean, you had to take supplies. You had to carry basically your supplies with you and hit, you know, points along the way to get rest and Over water. Over the river and through the woods. Yeah, and Maybe. water your horse. Yeah, it's a big deal. So he must have, uh, really wanted to see this conjure man. The slave used a, uh, divining stick or a divining, div divining stick. How well, yeah. You? I'm not sure what people call that. No, I think it's a divining stick. It's like when the people look for water and shit, right? Yeah, I know. And they got the rods. Somebody, uh, I know somebody who does that. They call it dousing. Yeah, and then when they cross or whatever. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I know someone, he was a minister, and um, he would douse for water. So, he'd take these two sticks, and he would find water for people, like if they were going to put a well on Some the of those people are strangely accurate with those things. Oh, he definitely was. And I think it has to do something with, like, magnet, magnetic shit of the earth or something. Right. Well, the stick uh -oh. this guy used had a glass ball that swung on the end from a cord. 
So think of like a pendulum. Okay. Right? The William slave was away at the time 